Listen, Brian and I were just um, we're just on our way out to meet some friends, and we're already like 45 minutes late. You know, we decided it was sort of time to tell something more about Shannon and Boone and their lives. You know, we knew that Boone, from his past behavior, was very possessive of Shannon, and we thought, well, maybe it would be interesting for the audience to discover that there was uh, more to their relationship than just mere sort of possess a brotherly interest. I get a call from Shannon and she's the damsel in distress and I go to save her. Help, help me! I go to save her, willingly, full of stupidity. I go to Sydney to get her. Basically get there and she sets me up. She sets me up for money. My money? Not necessarily her money. It was my it's money. family money. Which I got none of. Her logic. You should have just asked. As we started working out an island story, we thought, you know, we, we would revisit the idea of the monster and that we were sort of at a place narratively with Locke where Boone had become sort of his acolyte. We wanted to sort of do a story where Boone had to sort of shed his obsession with Shannon in order to sort of move forward in terms of his relationship with Locke. We came up with this idea of this vision quest as a way for Locke to provide Boone a test to really explore the nature of his relationship with his sister. And so during this vision quest, she appears to be attacked and killed by the monster. That was really fun. I mean, I was warned before I read the script. They were, Jack came to me and he was like, well, you know, on page such and such, it, it kind of looks like you're going to die. <laughs> just want to warn you that this is the story and it all works out and, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're still going to be here. Every time I read that episode, though, I mean, every page that I turned, I was like, oh my god! Oh my god! Basically, uh, Locke knocks me out and puts a hallucinogen on my head and I completely hallucinate running through the jungle thinking that Shannon died. And he realizes it's all a dream, but in experiencing Shannon's death, Boone had a chance to really get in touch with his most sort of primal feelings about his sister and and he felt relief and it was a really important and revelatory moment for that character because he then was able to come to terms with her in a way that he never had before. How did you feel when she died? I, I felt, I felt, I felt relief. He's a young guy, he was running a big corporation and uh, and I think he had a lot of responsibility, and that sort of what kept him going. Actually shooting the death sequence, the whole sequence with the blood and the water and the whole apocalypse now, truck through the jungle, and it was great, because our makeup artist, Steve, did the most beautiful job, and I had, like, basically a tracheotomy and, like, a piece of my shoulder missing, and you could see, like, the layers of flesh and blood, and it was great, and there was, like, a blood pump, and, I mean, whole body suit. I can't do stuff, I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> Also, the part where I got grabbed was really fun because I got to do my own stunt. And um, they had me in a whole body harness and I just got yanked up. I was on this pulley and then, you know, once I get to the top, it takes a while for them to yell cut and everybody stop what they're doing and, and put me back down. So in the meantime, I get to fly like Peter Pan or something. <laughs> and then we have a very interesting moment in the hotel coming back, which makes us... Why we hate you know, each other so much on the island. We, uh, we just keep it in the family. Absolutely. I mean, Ian's southern. He can understand that. Absolutely. I know how they do it in Louisiana. <laughs> we kind of came up with the idea that they were unrelated step-siblings who had, on one night, had an actual romantic encounter. And that became sort of the big twist and reveal for the backstory in our episode. You should just tell your mom that you rescued me again, just like you always do. And then we'll just go back. To what? To what it was. Like it's all up to you. I don't think you can fall a whole lot lower than um, being as calculated about being self-destructive and destructive towards um, the, the people you, know, you love than, than she was. And with the history she had and the amount of, of damage. And, uh, and really, <laughs> using sex to blackmail one's stepbrother emotionally is, is kind of low. Ian and I have this, shall we say, pre coital thing, which I personally think is way too good of an opportunity to just pass up. And I mean, come on, we've got to do something, right? It's too good of an opportunity to screw with Ian. So, it's going to be fun. When Maggie, Grace, chewed up garlic and onion yeah. and spit it into my mouth, 
We were making out in the scene and she spit garlic in my mouth while we were rolling. Obviously a practical jokes was coming and, and our cast is coming into practical jokes as well. And I thought, God, you know, it's our first kiss. We've, I've got to do something awful to him. They totally set me up. I left set. They had already, they had already wrapped. We'd, we had wrapped, they had checked the gate, everything, and I'm walking out and I hear, uh, bring Ian back in, please, the direct for Gosselin. I didn't want to ruin the actual scene, so I waited until the last take, and everybody was in on it except him. The whole crew knew, and they were just the whole time just like crossing their fingers. I thought it was a different take, because it wasn't this subtle, you know, pensive kiss. It was like a thing. And she had released a ball of sauteing garlic and onion into my mouth and it like went underneath under my tongue like you know like you let a fine wine go down and okay. now the guys like they have guys poker night and Jorge's like you know Maggie you can come to guys poker night if you wear your athletic cup and I'm like okay I'll hang <laughs>